Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Nari Heshbadi. I'm a board certified OBGYN in Everett, Washington, just north of Seattle. And today I'm back at Muckleteo Beach and I want to talk to you about inductions. Uh, so, inductions. Inductions are very, very common. It's something that we get a lot of questions from patients that, you know, right now in the United States, about 20% of all pregnant women have an induction for their pregnancy. And you know, induction is basically a process where we bring you in before labor starts and we're basically trying to induce labor and trying to get a vaginal delivery. Now, the reason for inductions is varied all over the place, but typically it's something like somebody has hypertension, diabetes, there's some medical condition which makes it beneficial for us to do an induction. Now, basically it boils down to, is it, is it more beneficial to get a timely delivery um, versus the risks of continuing a pregnancy. And so I'm not gonna go into all the details of induction because there's so many out there and that's something to sit down and talk with your provider about. Now, you know, with an induction, so when somebody comes in and we're gonna start an induction, what are the things we're gonna do? You know, there's all the general things we do when somebody first gets admitted. Um, we're gonna verify their history. We wanna make sure the baby is head down and that's either by an exam on the belly, a cervical exam, an ultrasound because we typically don't induce breech babies. Um, we've got the train passing through right now. One of the nice things about being on the beach side. Um, we want to make sure we've got, <laughs> we want to make sure we've got a good due date because we time inductions at certain times. So for instance, we generally try to induce people at 39 weeks or greater because it's less risk to the baby. Um, but sometimes there are medical reasons we have to induce somebody earlier than that. Uh, we're going to do a non-stress test or an NST and that's where we hook you up to the monitors and we watch the heartbeat pattern of the baby. We want to make sure that the baby's doing well and is going to tolerate an induction. So, you know, let's say we've got all that there and now you've come in for your induction. Uh, you know, first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out is your cervix favorable or unfavorable. And what that means is if your cervix is closed and thick and posterior, if we start oxytocin and get you contracting, we're probably not going to get anywhere. Our chance of success is going to be low. So an unfavorable cervix is one that needs something called cervical ripening or preparation in order before we can do the oxytocin part. And how we define that is we have a, a scoring system called a Bishop score and it assigns points based on your dilation, your effacement, or basically how thinned out the cervix is, the station of the baby's fetal head, meaning from minus five to plus five, how high or low is the baby, the consistency of the cervix, is it soft, is it firm, is it medium? and the position of it, meaning is it posterior where it starts before someone goes into labor or anterior where it ends up in somebody's labor. And you assign points to that. And so in general, a bishop score of six or less is considered unfavorable and then we're gonna do the ripening process. If somebody actually has a bishop score of eight or greater than when they start their induction, their chance of successfully having a vaginal delivery is pretty much equal as if they had come into spontaneous labor on their own. So let's start with those who need a ripening. There are two ways we can do ripening. One is medical and one is mechanical. So with the medical, the most common thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna use these pills called mesoprostol. They were uh, created in the 1970s. They are prostaglandin pills. So prostaglandins are the first part of what helps set off labor. Uh, and so these pills were originally created and still used to some extent for preventing ulcers, but then it was realized that they can make people contract, they can change their cervix, and so they're used for cervical ripening. Now to understand the process, we've got to think of what is normal labor because that's what we're trying to mimic when we bring somebody in for an induction. So the uterus, it's really amazing. So the uterus is this muscle. And so over the course of the pregnancy, it's going to enlarge as the baby enlarges, but not really contract very much. And then you've got the cervix and the connective tissue in there and it's firm and that's going to stay in there. And you know, when something goes wrong there, we get preterm labor or cervical insufficiency or things like that. But when things go well, the cervix is going to start undergoing some connective tissue changes, it's going to soften, it's gonna dilate, and then you're gonna start contracting and have a baby. And so we've gotta figure out how do we mimic that process in a shortened time frame because we need to for a medical reason for an induction. And so, you know, the first part of that process is release of things like prostaglandins. So these mesoprostal pills, you can give them orally or vaginally. We do them every four hours or so. And we give people these pills and basically we try to get their cervix to become favorable. And once it's favorable, then we can go on to our actual other induction techniques. Now, in general, once you come in and we start these pills, you're staying uh, until we're done with the process. We don't typically give people the pills and send them home because we're monitoring them. 
Uh, and we want to make sure that everything looks good uh, at that point. Uh, now there is, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, some other ways of medical management for this. So there's a gel, there's an insert that's a prostaglandin insert that can be used. I often don't use those methods. You know, when you take a look at the cost of the pills, it's about a buck versus, for instance, the insert, which is one or two hundred dollars. And when you look at the data, the pill is as effective, if not more effective, than the insert. So typically, but it's not wrong if somebody's using a gel or insert, but basically it's a prostaglandin. And once you get somebody favorable, you can start oxytocin or pitocin basically four hours after the last dose of pills. So that's the process we're going to do. I often tell patients, bear with us, be patient, because while we want to do that as quickly as possible, uh, you know, we really are sandwiching what would happen as far as your body naturally over a week or two outside, and we're trying to do that in a, in a more rapid time period. So I tell people, come in expecting to get some rest that first day and this process going on. Now the other way to do cervical ripening is mechanical. So the Foley catheter, the same Foley catheter that you're going to place to empty somebody's bladder at times when they're in a hospital, you can actually take that and place it into the cervix and we inflate it with like 60 cc's of fluid and sometimes we start a little bit of oxytocin with it, sometimes we don't and you put it on a little bit of tension on the leg and this is going to mechanically slowly dilate the cervix. You leave the Foley bulb in for up to about 12 hours unless it comes out early on its own. And when it comes out, you're usually three or four centimeters dilated. But on top of that, you've stretched the cervix, which has now resulted in the natural release of prostaglandins, which is going to hopefully make your cervix favorable and set off the process. Now, in general, with a Foley bulb, we also do that inpatient in the hospital. But there are times that we can do that as an outpatient because we're not giving you medicine. Now, we also sometimes intermix these things. So somebody will come in and we'll give them oral measles prostal pills, and if we don't get anywhere, we'll switch to vaginal or vice versa, or then we'll do a Foley bulb. So those are just kind of some methods and things that we have. Now, let's say once your cervix is favorable, or let's say you're favorable to start off with, meaning you're like three centimeters dilated and you come in and we want to start your induction. In that case, we can go ahead and just start some oxytocin. So oxytocin, you know, was first discovered in the early 1900s uh, by Sir Henry Dale. And they realized basically that if they took this extract from the pituitary gland and gave it, it would make the uterus contract. So oxytocin is actually Greek for swift labor. Um, and so then in the 1950s, it was synthesized, so we had it. So we can bring somebody in and we typically piggyback it with some IV fluids and we give somebody oxytocin and it's going to make their uterus contract. And people always ask me, well, is it going to be painful or what? Really the goal of the oxytocin is to make you contract enough to change your surface. And so we have set norms and standards and things we use for that. And the idea is we're just going to get you contracting until you're changing your cervix and then hopefully having a vaginal delivery. Now, occasionally someone says, can I do something other than oxytocin? You know, I don't want to do something medical. There are other things we can do that are just a little less effective. So for instance, if somebody comes in and they're dilated enough and the head is well applied, we can break their water. And that'll sometimes help throw them into labor. Now, when you really look at the data, if somebody's water's broken, if we watch them versus watch them and turn on some oxytocin, you're actually going to get a, a delivery sooner with the oxytocin. So that's something I often tell people up front. But, uh, the other thing is, you know, sometimes in the United States, but mostly overseas, things like nipple stimulation can cause contractions. The hard part there is there's no really way to titrate how often, what are you trying to do, how strong, but that is something else that's, that's out there that's available. Uh, now, you know, when you take a look at this and you go, okay, we've got somebody, we've brought in him, we've got the oxytocin going. Now, one of the best lectures I ever heard well, about inductions was the goal of an induction is not to bring somebody in, torture them for five days and do a C-section. So the goal really is to safely get a vaginal delivery out. And, you know, I often limit my inductions to a good medical reason, meaning that we need to because it's safer to have you have a baby than to wait. Because the goal is a safe, healthy baby, and we want to try to accommodate your wishes on how that's done. So, you know, I encourage you to tour the hospital you're going to deliver at, take a look. Completely okay, you know, ask about the C-section rate. You know, there's a wide variety of C-section rates around hospitals. If inductions are done well, you'll find there are hospitals that have very low C-section rates, very similar to spontaneous labor rates. And so it's okay to ask, what's your institution in C-section rate? Why am I being induced? You know, as we do this process, we will tell you we're doing this because we're doing this, or this is the next step. So it's okay to ask questions and be a part of that. We don't get offended. We actually, we're here to partner with you on your labor course. And then the final thing I throw out there is occasionally I've got somebody who's a higher risk pregnancy, diabetes or hypertension. We know we're going to do an induction in, you know, a week or two. And they're like, is there anything I can do? I really don't want to come in and be induced. And so one other thing that's out there is you can do stripping of the membranes. And, you know, that's 
Well, that's basically where you're checking the cervix, but you basically stretch the cervix as you do it. Uh, it's a little uncomfortable. You can get some spotting, you can get some contractions that'll last about 24 hours, but it increases the probability you're gonna come in spontaneous labor in the next 48 hours because it's stretching the cervix, helping for a natural release of prostaglandins to again, set off that natural process. Now, I'd point out there's a lot we don't know about labor. We don't understand preterm labor. We don't understand how all these hormones fully work. For instance, we know oxytocin has a, has a, a part in bonding and in sexual intimacy and in sexual function. There's things we just don't know. And so all of this is gonna change as it's going forward. These are things we've discovered in the last few decades. We're gonna change this process more and more as we try to figure out what's the safest way to mimic the natural process, but safely intervene when we have to, but leave things alone when we don't. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, and then, you know, we've got other videos out there on when we start antibiotics for groupie strep, about pain medicine and labor. So take a look at those videos to get other questions. Thanks a lot.